My name is Sephora Eldis and I'm going to moderate this first session of today, Performing the Self. Uh, to introduce the theme, uh, contemporary digital culture seems to revolve around the exchange of images on the one hand and an ongoing self-referring referring state of performance on the other. As pointed out by several artists, we increasingly face the ever so present circulation of images and information a phenomenon that is dominating digital culture and therewith everyday reality. At the same time, we become part of a condition which can be described as a constant state of performance, incited by social media networks who put an emphasis on online self-promotion. During this conversation, we aim to reflect on these realities from the perspective of photography. So today we have a round table um, panel with um, well, very interesting guests. Thank you for being here. Simon Baker, Willem Popelier, Juno Calypso, and Ashley Kane. But before that, we have an interview with Marcel Fell, uh, who is Deputy Director Artistic Affairs uh, at FOAM, uh, with Hans Eichleboom, Dutch artist. And I would like invite you to invite you to come uh, to the stage. And this first interview will be in Dutch, but uh, Marcel will also uh, explain in English. Um, so, just so you know. Thank you for coming up. table discussion will start to blossom in this early morning um, and that introduction is a short Q&A with Hans Eichelboom here next to me um, because we think that the best stage still is uh, for performing yourself is the public space. Uh, space. Um, the sidewalk is the ultimate platform to present your identity perhaps even in a performative way look at how people sometimes dress behave um, and really create a self that might not be in tune with, with who they are, who they are considered to be, or uh, who they think uh, they'll be. Hans is, well, strolling over the sidewalks for over 30, 35 years, um, being almost invisible. People are not aware he is an artist. They are not aware that somewhere underneath his raincoat there is a camera hidden and he takes hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pictures, I think, over the course of his decades of people. Um, and he selects them almost as typologies. And you can see that although we all attempt to be a very individual person, we are not. We are all uh, the same as other ones and we are quite easy to classify. Um, this work is fairly well known among most of the people. Um, less known is the work Hans made in the early 70s. Less known, but I think very, very interesting and still very relevant today and also relevant within the framework of performing the self. As Zippora already mentioned, uh, the short talk, far more than a Q&A, will be in Dutch, but I will do my utmost to translate on the spot. Not literally, but the essence. Um, before we show um, the first image of your work, Hans, perhaps you can, you can tell us a little bit more how you started. Let's go back to the early 70s. You were even a much younger artist then than you are today. Um, beginning of your career, how did you start? The vroege jaren, het is begin jaren 70. Hoe begon je als beeldkunstenaars in die tijd? Het mooiste verhaal vind ik altijd van hoe je begonnen was. Ik ben naar de kunstacademie gegaan uh, samen met mijn moeder om me daar op te geven. Really? Dat, dat, dat vind ik nog steeds zo'n raar moment dat ik me... Maar goed, uh, 1968, 19, 1969 uh, ongeveer. Ik was op dat moment heel erg geïnteresseerd in uh, architectuur. Ik ben naar de afdeling monumentale vormgeving gegaan van de academie in, uh, in Arnhem. Ik wilde op een bepaald moment... Uh, de natuur een rol laten spelen binnen de architectuur. Ik heb daar uh, een werk uh, 
hebben werk gemaakt voor Sonsbeek buiten de perken. Wat een heel bepalende tentoonstelling voor mij is geweest. Daar werd ik uh, voor het eerst eigenlijk geconfronteerd uh, in, op grote schaal met conceptuele, met conceptuele kunst. Daardoor werd mijn eigen werk ook wat, uh, wat conceptueler. En een heel belangrijk sleutelwerk is feit geweest dat ik niet meer de natuur uh, combineerde met architectuur, maar de natuur combineerde met mezelf. En de eerste serie uh, maakte waarin ik drijf en drijf nat uh, werd. Dus van een vrolijke meneer in de zon veranderde in een uh, verzopen kat, zal ik maar zeggen. So, Hans just said that he still is surprised that he went to art school together with his mother to submit. This was 68, 69. So that's really the first steps into the world of art. And a very important moment uh, in time was the exhibition Salzbeek, uh, Buitenwerken. I don't know how to translate this, but it's a very uh, important exhibition of sculpture um, outside. It was in a beautiful park with a lot of conceptual artists. And Hans was very interested in architecture uh, in the beginning. And there, uh, because of his participation in this exhibition, he learned to know, to, he learned more about conceptual art, learned how to appreciate art, and his first steps um, in, say, the field of conceptual art was the transformation of a person who was dry first, but turned out to be very wet. I think this is literal uh, afterwards. But Hans, can you, can you move to the first, because we don't have that much time, to the first series, perhaps you can have the, f the first image, um, and this is this one. We see a newspaper. Why is this an interesting page to share with the audience? Waarom is dit het eerste werk en waarom is dit een interessante krantenpagina? Nou ja, eerst maar even van ontbouwd. Heb je die stap gezet? En dan ga je in de weer met je eigen identiteit en op een bepaald moment kom je erachter dat die identiteit voor een heel groot deel ook bepalend wordt, bepaald wordt door de wereld waar je in leeft, de informatie die je krijgt omtrent die wereld. En dat daar de krant een heel belangrijke rol in, in speelde. En wat ik uiteindelijk gedaan heb is ervoor gezorgd dat ik tien dagen achter elkaar uh, in de krant, uh, in de krant kwam bij, ik dat het niet, maar in ieder geval tussen het triviale nieuws er was een, ik geloof dat dit het uitreiken is van een beker bij een schoolvoetbaltoernooi. Uh, daar ben ik tussen het publiek gaan staan en gefotografeerd. En op een bepaald moment, toen was het in die tijd nog zo dat in de... Nee, dat Otherwise, it's far too much for me to translate. Uh, in the early 70s, Hans became far more, uh, still uh, uh, more interested in, in identity questions, identity matters, and he learned that the outer world was hugely influential on the whole notion of identity. And an important source of, uh, was, of course, the newspaper, just the newspaper. And he thought, well, let's try to have my picture in the newspaper for 10 days in a row. So here you can see different pages uh, and in every picture there one can uh, identify Hans and his, his face. I'm not sure where you are in this picture. Let's have a look. So, so you managed to, to have your face on the same page, page twice. Yeah, yeah, that was a very good day. A very good day. Yeah. <laughs> that was the best, the best one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so how, how did you, just from a practical point of view, how did you manage? Did you have a, a scanner? Uh, how did you identify the moments that were, well, interesting for the photojournalist? In die tijd had je in de kranten nog een uh, agenda. Dus uh, laat ik zeggen, op dinsdag was er een, uh, stond er een agenda in de krant wat voor uiterst interessante dingen er op woensdag zouden uh, gebeuren. En daar pikte ik er dan vier of vijf uh, uit en ging, naartoe, ging er naartoe en hoopte dat ik me zo in het publiek kon opstellen of anderszins. En aan de andere kant was het ook nog zo dat je toen vrij makkelijk de politieradio kon, uh, kon opvangen. Daar luisterde ik ook naar en zo gauw ik hoorde dat er ergens een, een, een fijn ongeluk was gebeurd, ging ik daar later snel op mijn fietsje, op mijn fietsje naartoe. Ja. 
So in these days there was still an agenda in every newspaper. So for instance on, on Tuesday there were a list of interesting activities uh, happening on Wednesday and Hans decided just to visit these moments, uh, these activities, hoping he will uh, get his picture uh, taken and published. And sometimes it happens, sometimes of course it didn't. Uh, but he also made use of a police scanner. Um, well, it's a nice accident, beautiful, might be a nice picture. So, ten uh, days, Hans in the newspaper. Uh, let's move on to, to another project. project of the early 70s. With your family, what are we looking at? Yes, a typical uh, 70s family. <coughs> Ja, daar, daar kijk je naar, 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 naar vier heel gelukkige jonge gezinnen in het bezit van, uh, van, uh, van, van twee kinderen uh, in een echte uh, uh, jaren zestig uh, uh, omgeving. Alleen ja, het enige wat er vreemd is aan die beelden, dat telkens dezelfde vader uh, uh, het, het, hoofd is, uh, het hoofd is van het gezin. En dat het in feite ook zo wonderbaarlijk is dat de gezinnen zo precies, zo precies kloppen. Dat is, er zit nergens, uh, hè, dat je denkt, goh, hier, de, nou ja, je ziet nergens dat geanceneerde foto's, laat ik het zo maar zeggen. So four pictures of typical happy families in the early 70s, and they're all equally happy, they all look the same, they all behave the same. So there's no way for us to tell whether this is a staged family setting or not. So it's hard to set the staged reality apart from the real reality. There's only one strange thing. The father is the same, of course. Hans, what on earth did you do to make it? And why are you so interested in the ordinary life of ordinary families? No, it is dus meer dat ik heel erg geïnteresseerd was in mijn eigen in mijn eigen leven op dat moment. You were far more interested in your own life. And in mijn eigen identiteit. And uh, dat ik heel goed voelde van uh, nou ja, in dit geval dat mijn leven vier heel verschillende kanten uit zou kunnen gaan door de beslissingen die ik op dat moment uh, zou nemen. En dat was in feite de, ja, de basis om dit, om, dit werk, uh, om dit werk te maken. So the important reason for you to make this work was the awareness that you were in a moment in time in your life that every decision could lead you to another direction. Um, but it seems like whatever direction you decided to take, you ended up same because we have four more or less identical families yeah 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 i <laughs> i think that that has to do with with of, of that has to make with the context where i think the the families uh, the families uiteindelijk uh, haalde mm -hmm. toch heel erg vanuit mijn eigen omgeving mm -hmm. dus yeah. daarom dat er een zekere overeenkomst yeah. in so in the families zijn. they resemble your own family life. You can yeah, really identify with yeah. these people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can we go to another project? Identity. I know the Wereldwinkel still. That was a, a shop in which you could buy very, um, how do you say it? Well, stuff from the, what we call the third world. Am I still allowed to say the word third world? Or am, I, am I shot on the spot? But this was it, like a typical 70s ideological uh, shop. What do we see? You're standing there. It's also interesting to see your face, and it changes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Maar wat je wat 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 je ziet. Inform us about about yeah, what you what you see to is is het resultaat uh, ja van een uitgevoerd concept. Ik uh, ben op bad ben toen ik een jaar of nou laten we zeggen 15 was verhuisd van de ene stad naar de, naar de andere stad, in dit geval van Nijmegen naar uh, Arnhem. Ik heb op een bepaald moment, toen ik 25 was, een lijst van mensen gemaakt waarvan ik zeker wist dat die nooit meer iets van mij gehoord hadden en nooit meer iets van mij gezien uh, hadden. En die heb ik door een vriend van mij laten benaderen met de vraag wat denk je dat er van Hans Eikelboom terecht is, uh, is gekomen. Nou ja, wat je daar ziet is een, is een boswachter, dus een van de mensen die benaderd uh, werd. Die, uh, die vertelde, ja goed, ik kan hem nog wel goed uh, herinneren. Hij had ouders die heel veel van de natuur hielden, die ieder weekend op de fiets er op uit uh, gingen. Dus nou ja, volgens mij kan het bijna niet anders dan dat hij uh, 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 iets met de natuur is gaan studeren. Weer een ander wist 
dat mijn grootvader een fanatiek amateurfotograaf was en met mij op pad ging en die veronderstelde wel dat ik fotograaf geworden zou. So Hans just told me that when he was 15 years old, his parents decided to move from one city to another, from the city of Nijmegen to the city of Arnhem, approximately 20, 25 kilo, kilometers away. And when he was 25, so 10 years later, he made a list of people, uh, and he was quite certain that those people never heard or seen something of Hans during the last 10 years. And then he decided to approach these people, to look after them, to approach them, and ask the question, what can you still remember Hans from 10 years ago? And how do you think he looks like now? What kind of profession do you think Hans has? And he said, one, if you can go back. One knew that Hans was, uh, well, somebody who really appreciated nature. So he was convinced that Hans would be, what is it? And, and Boswag, a forest uh, keeper there, that's Hans, according to one of those 25 people. Another one said, well, Hans was really in love with photography, so he must be a photographer. So these are Hans, according to another one. We can go on slightly faster. Or oh, Hannah, politician, or oh, this is Hans. What? Vliegenier. Ah, of course. Ik was, ik was een ontzettend fanatieke bouwer van balsa houten modelvliegtuigjes. Was hij? Was so you were the pilot? Ja, ja, ja. 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 So, nou ja, het interessante aan het project is natuurlijk dat op basis van een heel, heel, ja, heel weinig informatie in feite iemand een beeld uh, over, je, uh, over je heeft. En ik, ja, gewoon de gedachte dat je in de hoofden van allerlei verschillende mensen een ander mens bent, dat fascineerde me buitengewoon. So, Hans' fascination was that people had an image, an idea about who he was in the head. So everyone of those 25 people had a completely different idea uh, on Hans, about Hans and his identity, based on really nothing, just a few lines, a few lines that remembered brought him back 15 years ago. And based on that, they were convinced that Hans would look one or the other. So identity is... is to a large extent a mental thing. Yeah. Um, dan gaan we nu over naar de politiek. Yeah, let's, ja, go, into, we, let's go into uh, politics, uh, because uh, you uh, turned uh, out to be yeah. a politician, okay. of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dat is misschien een lastige foto, want niemand <laughs> bijna herkent meer de situatie. Maar dit is het gesprek, een gesprek van mij met iemand die minister was uh, in, uh, in die tijd. Dus een heel belangrijke persoon in de, in de politiek. Ga nog eens één verder, dat is Hans van, oh, nou ja, Ed van, van Ed van Tijn. So th these were all ministers, politicians on a national level. Ja. Um, and you decided to, to join the political force. Ja, ik, ik, ik dacht van, van, ik ga met hun op, op de foto, associeer me met, met, uh, met, met de macht uh, in feite. En dan ontstaat dezelfde situatie als je die beelden gezamenlijk toont. Wie is die jongen eigenlijk die zo belangrijk is in de Nederlandse politiek dat hij regelmatig overlegt met alle ministers uh, die, we, die we hebben? So, this was just a way, an attempt to, to be very apparently very influential as a politician because look there's a photograph with every minister so this guy with the moustache must be a very important and influential person within politics uh, so you're, you're playing the game of deceiving people based on these images but how did these images uh, uh, occur how did you make it made you Did you call the minister and say, ja. hey, can we, yeah? Ja, can we ja. sit? Ja, in die zin is de wereld totaal veranderd, ja. Je, 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 je This belde, was possible in the 70s. Je belde op en je kreeg contact met de, met de voorlichter van, van die minister. En dan moest je wel, maar nou, zelfs kon ik ze nog wel overtuigen dat het, uh, uh, dat het een belangrijk inhoudelijk kunstwerk was. En dat ze daarom uh, moesten, moesten meedoen. So you really open, you just said, I'm ja. a conceptual artist, this ja. is a very important piece of art ja. and you have to be in. Ja, ik geloof dat, dat die niet erin zit, maar er, er is nog een andere. Dat ik, het leek me zo ontzettend interessant om aan de minister van cultuur te vragen om een foto van mij te, te maken. Omdat ik dacht, nou, dat kan niet anders. Ik bedoel, als de minister van cultuur een foto van me maakt, dan moet dat een betere foto worden dan... Uh, en dat, ik, dat is dus ook gebeurd. Dus de voorlichter van toen, minister van Doorn, is gebeld en... en uh, 
die, ja, die vond het wel interessant. So Hans Hans also decided to ask the Minister of Culture to take a picture of him because the Minister of Culture, being the Minister of Culture, would be the person who took the best picture possible. Otherwise, there was no need for the minister to be the minister of culture. So this happened, and it was a beautiful picture. A very good, very good picture. picture. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on. We have just a, a few yeah, yeah. minutes, so no, okay. we'll speed it up. Uh, the, 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 yeah, okay. the, the ideal man. The ideal man. I have been in the under under 100 women, and they asked how the ideal man was uh, looking at them. De kleren bij elkaar gezocht om een foto te laten aangeven op mijn gezicht hoe die man eruit moest zien. En een fotosessie gemaakt. En uh, wat je nu ziet voorbij komen is uh, tien ideale mannen met de beschrijving uh, daarbij. En je hebt honderd geïnterviewd? Nee, ik, ik heb een honderd vrouwen gevraagd en daar de tien okay. meest verschillende... Ja, dat okay. sloeg ik so, over. Hans interviewed honderd different women and uh, asked them to describe the ideal husband. Uh, and he selected 10, the most varied. So here you see the description, so almost a literal description uh, by the housewives. Um, and of course, Hans attempt to fulfill their fantasies by becoming the ideal husband. So fantasy became words, words were written down, and finally it was uh, a, a transformation of you and then you came back to the housewives, to the wives, you rang the bell and look, hey, <laughs> no, no, here no, I am. No, no, they were invited in the studio and, ah. and, and give, uh, and, and moesten aanwijzingen geven van, uh, nou ja, hoe het allemaal precies eruit moest zien en hoe het baardje moest zitten. En, okay. en weet ik so the, the ten women were present in the studio yeah. and they gave all kind of um, so, uh, advice how to dress um, while becoming their Flashy fantasy. Ja, ja want je ziet ook dat ze een foto zit in het werk van de betreffende dame plus haar ideale man op dat moment. Goed, volgende. Toch? Yes, next. Ja, nee, tien, wat anders dan. We can talk much, much longer about this particular project. Ja, ja, we will give the floor to our let, let's, let's do some advertising. Is this possible? Ja. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, ja, je moet je voorstellen, acht uh, uh, affiches in van die grote publex, uh, 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 ja, van die grote publex worden. Een, 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 een Nederlands uh, station. Dit, nou, ja, ik, ik heb al die affiches dus zo goed mogelijk nagemaakt. Hè. Dus dit, dit waren bestaande affiches op dat moment. En die heb ik zo precies mogelijk nagemaakt met als enige verschil dat ik de meneer was uh, er... Uh, Erin. En aan enerzijds om aan te tonen van dat de, de, ja, de, uh, wij allemaal fotomodel kunnen zijn als er maar een beetje aan onze uiterlijk gesleuteld uh, wordt. En aan de andere kant vond ik het toen heel interessant om die affiches in een bepaalde context te, te presenteren. Omdat mensen dan na verloop van tijd erachter kwamen dat in iedere reclame dezelfde meneer uh, op, uh, op, optrad. En, uh, I'll try to translate. So obviously these were existing uh, advertising images from the 70s, uh, quite well known. I do recognize all of them. Um, and Hans tried to do a remake as good as possible, so it's absolutely identical, uh, except for the fact that Hans is the protagonist in all the pictures. So he thought it's nice to uh, prove that everyone can be a photo model. Everyone can be a, a potential superstar, and he was also interested to learn the responses from the audience when they noticed that all these advertising campaigns uh, showed one and the same person. So Hans, these pictures, they were actually presented in public space on the sidewalk? Ja, het, het, uh, op een bepaald moment heb ik, heb ik er een tentoonstelling mee gemaakt op een, uh, op een station. Want daar, daar werden de meeste publics worden uh, vertoond. En, en nou ja, dat was natuurlijk prachtig dat, dat, uh, dat iemand komt een station op, ziet het eerste affiche niets aan de hand, ziet het tweede affiche en denkt, hé, hey, ziet het derde affiche. Maar het, 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 slechte van, het, slechte, het slechte van dit project was dat ik het goed had gedaan. Dus dat, dat, ik, ik, ik had, dat, ja, dat was een ontzettende vergissing. Ik had veel meer mezelf in al die affiches moeten, mo mo moeten blijven. So it was actually shown on a, a train station, because most of the 
posters were normally presented at the train station. So it was some sort of exhibition with all the posters. And of course the idea was that somebody would look uh, at the first poster, poster and nothing happened. Seeing the second poster and hey, there's some kind of strange thing. A third poster well, and so on and so forth. Um, the whole idea more or less failed because Hans was far too good in uh, well, trying to mimic the original one. Uh, and nobody, well, nobody, no, not that many people really understood that these were one and the same person. So you had to be, you had to involve yourself perhaps far more convincingly instead of trying to mimic the original model uh, to such extent. Yeah. The last one. Oh no, we're there. We're way over time. I'm terribly sorry to the ones who will take the stage now. Um, Zippor, may I invite you? Thank you, Hans, okay. for this wonderful introduction. I, th I think your work is still worth, particularly these two, to see and present to the work. It's quite contemporary and relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Talk about the last. Is that the even? What is this for me? Famous last words. Last words. Yeah, I think it is this for me also very interesting and also very nice that that work that I have made so in the 70s years that there is still a lot of interest for it, and that on the other hand for the news to work that I make. Ja, ook nog heel veel belangstelling uh, is. Dus dat op een bepaald moment in situaties, bijvoorbeeld als kort geleden dan in Londen, dat in het EU Museum een werk wordt getoond uit, 19, uh, nee, uit 1972. In, uh, dat, ja, dat was in de tijd. En dat in het Barbican uh, werk wordt getoond wat ik in, uh, in 2016 heb gemaakt. Dat is natuurlijk een ideaal. <laughs> So uh, Hans is very pleased that his work is considered to be still relevant and this sometimes leads to a situation as recently in London that the Tate showed work of 71 and the Barbican showed work of 2016 and Hans, you're quite consistent. Thank you. Um, well, speaking of London, I would like to invite uh, our guest panel to the stage. Uh, Juno Calypso, Calypso, Ashley Kane, Willem Populier, and Simon Baker. And while you're gonna make yourself comfortable on this table, I'm also gonna officially introduce you. Let's start with Simon. Uh, curator Simon Baker is Tate's, Tate's first curator of photography and has been working st since 2009 at Tate Modern and Tate Britain and in advisory roles for Tate St. St. Ives and Tate Liverpool. Major exhibitions on which he has worked include William Klein and Dido Moriyama, Conflict Time and Photography, and most recently, Performing for the Camera. Simon Baker's research interests encompass many aspects of the history of photography, from the 19th century to the present day, that focuses on early to the mid 20th century modernist photography within and beyond Europe, the post-war avant-garde in Japan, and many aspects of contemporary photographic practice. Welcome, Simon. Then we go to Willem Populier. Willem Populier, born in 1982, is a Dutch artist working with photography. His focus is on the mechanisms and politics of representation. He researches the generally accepted ways in which portraits are used and how identity is represented and perceived through photography. Thus, his focus is mostly on popular culture, the ubiquitous image and its effects on society. For Unseen 2016, he led the project The Art of Making Selfies. Youngsters of the PIT and residents of nursing home De Bocht Westerbeer formed pairs and worked on modern self-portraits <coughs> doing this project. Welcome, Willem. Next to Willem sits Ashley Kane. Ashley Kane is an art and culture editor for Days Digital. She lives and works in London. Dazed, formerly Dazed and Confused, is a monthly British style magazine founded in 1991. It covers music, fashion, film, art and literature. Dazed was started in 1991 and began as a black and white folded poster published periodically. The magazine soon turned full color, promoted with London Club Nights. Welcome Ashley. And then, at last, Juno Calypso. Artist Juno Calypso was born in 1989 and lives and works also in London. 
She studied photography at London College of Communication and went to Chelsea School of Art. She participated in numerous group shows and was widely discussed in art magazine and press. In 2011, after decades of making pictures of herself in private, she began a series of self-portraits in which she staged herself as a character named Joyce. This year, Juno Calypso was selected for folk talent and is featured in the magazine and the exhibition. Thank you, Juno. Thank you all for being here. Um, well, we had a wonderful introduction, I think, uh, with Hans Eichelbaum and Marcel. And um, I would like to start with you, Simon, um, because um, for the, uh, the catalogue for uh, performing for the camera, you ended your essay with, um, well, reflecting upon the fact that, uh, yeah, that performing for the camera now is a daily fact of life. And we saw these uh, very ordinary situations already coming back in Hans Eichelbaum's work. Um, when you, yeah, in your in your exhibition, you also reflected on this whole history of performing for the camera, and you talked about uh, performative photography. Could you say something about what that means? Yeah, I think um, I think I made up that word. That's um, that's good. <laughs> it, kept, it kept coming up in spell check as like something that didn't exist. Like performative photography, I think it was like. A can you hear uh, Simon? Is the is the phone on? It's sort okay. of. Is it on? Yeah. Perhaps a bit closer okay. to your. So. <laughs> Perfect. So I, I'm not sure that like performative photography is a phrase. I don't think it exists. Um, we just used it because it seemed to make sense about some kind of relationship between those two terms, between yeah. performance as an idea and uh, photography as a, as a medium. And I guess what we were thinking about, particularly in that show, were the differences between performances that are documented by a camera, which could be... Um, Eve Klein or somebody of that nature making a performance and then having someone document it and then some performance that only happens because the camera is there, yeah. um, which was the sort of line we were trying to explore. And I think that became um, really the, the central idea of the show. And in fact, uh, the thing we were most interested in at first were, were um, real collaborations between photographers and performers, where you had an equal crediting between the two. But then it turned out that there were very few, and very, very few, actually. Yeah, it was very um, special, yeah. And that, that became kind of the middle of the show. And from there, we, uh, the, the one that we, we were most sort of um, excited by, I guess, was Aiko Hazoe, the Japanese photographer who worked with uh, Tatsumi Hijikata. And when they published their work together, it was equally credited. And I think that's very unusual in the history of performance or in photography. So that's sort of where performative photography came from. It's like some kind of use of the medium that's really specifically about producing something for the camera. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, when we talk about photography and that photography is much more than only documenting, but also kind of displacing the performance and, and bringing, bringing it into time, again, into other times and other situations. I must also think uh, of Willem Populier's work because uh, you once wrote, of, you once said actually, that in 2008 when you graduated, um, you showed pictures of your family, actually, just like uh, Hans Eichelboom did, and your exam committee was saying, um, this is, this is actually photography. And it's interesting because I think also when you talk about what performative photography is or what um, photography is as an art form, I think we're also thinking about this blurred line between amateur photography and professional photography. And it's all the way apparent there, of course. Um, so Willem, um, how, do you, how, do you, yeah, how do you reflect on this, this, this constant, and apparently it's still going on, this constant discussion about if photography is art and also if amateur photography can be art, part of art? Um, well, <laughs> let me think. That's a big question. No, yeah, but I, I think we always have this notion of is a photograph art or not? Since we have this much, much photography in the world, which is not photography for an art form, but photography for the usage, usage in daily life. Um, and where those two meet, I think uh, you can get a you can get an intense discussion on is it art or is it just I don't know a, a stupid picture for a stupid subject. Um, 
uh, when I graduated, I had a, I, I had a lot of trouble graduating with the project, um, and um, and to me it was kind of a well a compliment that my own teachers or, or the ones that, that that followed me for four years that they said well it's it's so nice but of of course it's not real photography so uh, and it stick it's it sticks to me until this day that I question this sentence like what's what is then real photography and um, and I, I used to make very um, beautiful images like very aesthetic images um, but right now I'm over the course of the last years, I, I just make images that have nothing to do with aesthetics and all with like the way we used to see uh, images of ourselves in society. Yeah, and perhaps we can see a few examples of your work. They should be in this presentation. Thank you. Can you say something about this? Uh, yeah, this is one of my key. It's not. It's not a, a work which is very uh, big or something or, or a huge project. But it, to me, it's a key a key work since um, uh, this this is a photo of m me and my tw identical twin brother, and um, uh, I, I have absolutely no clue who I am. So right now, I'm looking at it uh, at the monitor, and you're looking at it at the screen. Um, so I'm looking at myself, but I don't know if I'm looking at myself. Right? I mean. So it's kind of a mental thing, yeah. um, and it and it occurred to me that it's always this trained question about who are you in this picture, and I and it's always this trained answer. Well, my mother said I'm the one on the I don't know left, right, you name it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter because that's the way we deal with photography. That we want to know who are you in the picture, but it's not who are you in the picture. I recognize myself twice in the picture, yeah. so my statement is this is me twice. Okay, yeah. That's nice to have a double picture of yourself in this. Uh, well, so it became apparent to me that a portrait is not something that you can take for granted or which is obvious. So. Um, uh, I, I became. I, I started thinking about what is the obvious usage of a portrait. So the most official usage is, of course, an identity picture, uh, which is a, which has a history which is only a hundred or hundred and fifty years old. Um, and um, I started going to shops and asking for an identity picture for my passport. Um, but instead of just applying to all the rules, I learned all the rules by heart, all the rules for a Dutch uh, uh, photo, that is, mm -hmm. and they are 39, so I went to 39 shops and, um, and, and just said, I need a passport photo, and sneakily tried to bend the rules, and with the result, went to the, the, to the government to apply for a passport 39 times, and 20 of these are rejected. Um, I don't know which ones by now, by myself, but I never mention it, but it's more the question like, when is a passport photo representing you as an official document, when is it rejected and what's the difference and how can you relate to photography in terms of rules and, and, and criteria? And do you have an answer for that or also? No. Or no it's more like no. an investigation. In, um, well, it's, it's pretty random actually, except for the rules that come from, yeah. of course, governments. And this project? Oh, this Sorry. is a um, visual proof of my existence. Uh, when, I, when I was studying in my master's, uh, we went to uh, Florida, uh, to Orlando, and I, I just decided to, to not take my camera with me anymore. Mm -hmm. Since there are so many cameras everywhere documenting everything around us, I just said I'm going to, to, to go on a trip as a tourist and, um, and, and just take pictures of myself being there as, as, a, as, a, as a random tourist, but without my own camera. So I just sneakily uh, uh, entered other people's uh, uh, tourist photos yeah. uh, and asked for the result afterwards. Sounds also like something that Hans Eichelboom could have done back in the 70s. Well, Hans is That's a huge example. So yeah, yeah, of course he is, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, oh, and this work? Sorry? Yeah, the other work. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is more a uh, late work that I'm... 
try, there's a huge difference in depicting a man or a woman uh, in our society, and I, I, it's it's super strange to me, and I I don't know what yeah why and. It's, it fascinates me, so uh, I, it's, I started to work on this theme, what to say, and the f one of the first projects was um, just analyzing what's happening on a, on a typical cover for a fashion magazine, which is always with a woman, stylized, um, and I, I just stripped everything, including the typography and including the women, and just put myself in there. I don't know if that image is there as well. <laughs> Just to see, am I becoming a professional model? Am I being, uh, I mean, many, many people, uh, when it's exhibited, many people call me a gay person. Uh, so I'm looking for like these reactions uh, to see how do we interpret an image like this suddenly when it's stripped from all the things that we take for granted. Oh, thank you. Um, I think also this, this question of identity and male and female identity easily bridges to your work, uh, Juno, of course. And the interesting thing is that while you are working much more uh, with, um, well, I think identity and uh, posing oneself in photography in real life and also all the things that come with our reality and, and, and well, everything that is around us, you create these fictional characters and these fictional situations. Uh, and perhaps we can show a first project and talk a little bit about it. Can you say something about your choice? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Is it working? Okay. Yeah, so I gave this character a name and I really regret doing that because now I hate the name. And I hate the character, <laughs> but not hate, but it's... I started it when I was a student at university and it, I kind of... My audience at the time was just my friends and my teachers, so I was entertaining them I didn't have an outside audience and so I was just making this for them and being like how can I make everyone laugh how can I make this funny how can I entertain everyone while we're doing these boring two-hour critiques of like pictures of rocks and whatever so it's like let me do something fun that'll make everyone laugh and so I made this character Joyce and I gave her a name and it's just stuck and people kind of describe her as an alter ego which it helps to describe her as an alter ego so everyone understands what it is but it's not I think that gives the impression that I'm like dying to be this other person when I'm not. Like I don't feel more comfortable being her. It's not like she's my, yeah, my secret character. She's just a bit of fun. And what is she doing right here? Oh, that one. I was wearing a mask that's supposed to make your face sweat. <laughs> if you can't yeah. write. And the little lines, you're supposed to massage your face for like 30 minutes every day which is obviously rubbish. So it's, it doesn't a, it's work. a weird beauty to... Beauty, like absurd beauty rituals is what I'm into, which kind of mirrors the absurdity of photography where you're just doing something over and over again to create this perfect image, which is what women or men or what I was doing when you're kind of doing things over and over again to make the perfect self. Yeah. So. And on the one hand, this is a very daily thing and an ordinary thing, but the staging and the setting is very, I think also it has a cinematographic feel. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this dark, obsession-like, uh, dready kind of situation. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's almost a narrative that, that mm -hmm. you kind of suspend the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you choose this, this set and this feeling? Um, I think the feeling I was just born with, I think I was just born disappointed, <laughs> that's how I would describe myself. Um, I'm just very, a very disappointed person and I have huge fantasies in my head of what I want my life to be like and then the result is obviously always going to disappoint me. And so I think what I'm doing here is I prepare a lot before, so I spend a lot of time choosing the location, choosing the costumes, the wigs, the props, but once I arrive at the location, I have no idea what I'm going to do. It's just complete improvisation. So it always ends up with, and I'm completely alone as well, there's no assistance. It's been so smooth, actually. So smooth? Yeah, I think oh, thanks. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's like, I feel like the perfection, there's, yeah, there's a theme of perfection going through it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once I'm there, I have no, I, I just play around, but I usually end up on the floor looking sad. That's well, looking sad and emotions that actually, uh, <laughs> this is a bridge to you also, because I think this, um, 
having fantasies, but also having the means to kind of fulfill your fantasies through the camera and through photography. That's something that's accessible to many people also, not artists, but people on Instagram and social media platforms. You also wrote about it, you're also working for Days Digital. Um, what do you think that this kind of shown your identity, but also again, within the frames of these social media platforms, what does this to um, well, the younger generation that we have now? Um, I, I think that with social media and having platforms like Instagram or Snapchat, um, obviously we have like on the screen now you can see Amalia Orman, this is from her Excellences and Perfections project, um, where basically she just you know started an Instagram account and started and kind of made this narrative up that she had had a, um, she was like a post-op recovery like princess. Um, who was really wealthy, was like going to spa days and everything, when in reality she was recovering from a bus crash in hospital. Um, it's really interesting because with Amalia, I'm really fascinated with her because she has like tricked, I think she ended up having tens of thousands of followers, I can't remember, maybe 70,000 or something, um, once it was finished. Um, she tricked basically all of them into thinking that this was her, but in reality, you know, she was kind of just sneaking into spas and, and like going to restaurants and she was broke, she was a broke artist. Um, using social media, she's obviously been able to elevate herself as an artist and that character. Um, I, you know, what looks like a selfie, like looks like her posing in the mirror with her bum out. Uh, most people might just take that at the face value of being narcissistic, but really it's a critique on the fact that I guess we are all so easy to believe what we see. Um, playing into the you know ideas of celebrity as well that we see you know her looking amazing at spa and we want to be that she's kind of you know giving us something to aspire to um, which is the scary thing about social media I think uh, in terms of what it can do and what it can make us think yeah so you think it's also it's not because critiques say that everyone is now actually a narcissist mm. because it's possible but you also see this 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 empowerment in it and I don't think it always has to have a narcissistic quality. Um, in the piece I wrote for Unseen magazine, uh, I speak about Petra Collins as well. Um, hers is, you know, she kind of took this photo of her in a bikini bottom and she had like pubic hair out the sides and stuff. Um, she posted it on Instagram and they took it down and this is kind of when this, I feel like this is kind of when the censorship thing really, really kicked off. Um, then she posted on Twitter, you know, thanks Instagram for, making us realize women's bodies need to be censored or something. I can't remember exactly what her words were. But I don't, I don't think she was, this is not narcissistic, I don't think this is narcissistic. I think this is, the, with Petra's work, and I don't think Amalia's is narcissistic either, but um, with Petra's work, I think she's really trying to break down beauty standards of what we see. And whether that's like, she's taking it to the extreme, like not all women look like this, but not all women, you know, look you know, perfectly shaven and everything. She's just kind of giving us the alternative um, in her work, which, you know, often features uh, girls with body hair, uh, period blood, all this kind of stuff that we, you know, never seen before in advertising. And it's actually having an effect now. Well, what's come from social media, we can kind of see um, makeup brands, beauty brands, taking that on board. And we see armpit hair in campaigns, we see, makeup less girls we see uh, there was recently an ad which actually showed period blood which was amazing it was groundbreaking you know so this blue liquid um so which is disturbing um but yeah i think you know it, it, people looking at social media these artists are infiltrating something which people often take as face value yeah um i mean if you look at my selfies they don't mean anything it's just where i am that's like you know probably a narcissistic value to it i'm not saying anything with them yeah. but you know someone like juno is um has obviously you know produced and, and they've you know got a high production value to them even though you're doing them by yourself um that's very different so i think you know the selfie is something that's been undermined for so long, but obviously has a lot of power behind it to say a lot of things. Yeah, and um, Simon, because we, we talked about this history of performative photography, which is your phrase, but <laughs> still, um, and we look now at, at, at our times in which everyone has 
you know, the means to access photography. Um, how do you see that this affects uh, contemporary artists? And uh, well, you're saying that they are infiltrating these social media platforms. And how do you see this? See this in perhaps also more conventional art spaces, museums, art spaces. Um, well, I mean, I guess we had uh, Amalia Oman in our show. Um, which was kind of disappointing in a weird way because that was the thing that most people were interested in. I mean, I found that very strange. You mean the visitors, all visitors? Uh, or... And the press. You know, okay. it's, it was as if, like, oh, suddenly you have Instagram in the tape. Like, this is a big deal. Yeah. Um, I thought it was probably... I thought that was kind of problematic in a way, as yeah. if, like, bringing something from outside the museum into the museum was something new. Yeah. I think photography has always monopolized whatever um, whatever um, means of delivery it could get hold of. So, um, Hans Eichelbaum was using the, the local newspaper or advert, advert, sort of advert, adverts outside the station. Yeah. Um, now you can use Instagram or whatever those other ones are called. Um, yeah. It's just another way of delivering. Uh, photography is very good at that. It's very good at becoming, at getting to new places, getting where it's going. Um, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of magazines, there's a lot of things online. I think the job of the museum is then to try and work out if any of it has any value at all. Yeah. Some of it may have no value, like zero value, literally like you're saying, like some people's Instagram accounts are literally, look, this is where I was today, I'm not making any claim about it. Other things, maybe Amalia Ullman was using it for a very specific reason. I think yeah. um, what you're saying is right, but also I think it's important to say she had the Instagram account beforehand. She was using it normally before she started faking it. So there was a sort of sense in which she kind of rewired her own, uh, something that she had herself. And I think that um, ability of artists to very, very cleverly rewire something that we all think we understand, yeah. um, like Hans. I mean, Hans was doing it in the 70s. Uh, so many artists were doing this a long time ago. M uh, many, many feminist artists were using um, the pages of magazines and using mass media, using mm -hmm. um, drawing attention to body issues that you're describing in the 60s and 70s. So it's just a question of how you deliver these ideas to the to a public. And um, do you see a development also going into the future that uh, how um, yeah this delivering because I mean I think these social media platforms it's not just about them but they are they are changing rapidly we also have snapchat now Instagram stories uh, came so there's also video moving image coming in this whole you know performing yourself um, situation um, what do you think is going to happen what are contemporary art artists focusing on now do you see some you should uh, you should ask the artists I mean I have no idea I didn't even know about snapchat I don't know what it is oh, I have no idea well, I can I'm like, use it right now. Sure. <laughs> like really I don't know like I had to have um, a younger colleague explain Amalia Oman's work to me it's yeah. not something you know it's not my world it's their world like it's another another time well, it's a I new thing no but it's of course because things are rapidly changing and it is another world and you're much into that world also, but then you, it's actually a project here at NC to bring uh, older people and very young people together to make selfies and self-portraits through selfies. And can you say something about what happens when, when this, these two project. worlds came together yeah, in this project? I, I uh, let uh, teenagers selfies together with elderly people and not just selfies, but um, uh, as my own point, yeah, well, I, I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as as my my um, in my in my project on selfies, I reenacted like famous or stupid selfies. Uh, so I I, I uh, took those with me, those original selfies, and uh, well, these elderly people were suddenly um, posing as Kim Kardashians, uh, which was super fun, but also I think it addressed a very important issue on how we think about selfies that it's more a means of communicating especially with snapchat even if you don't know what snapchat is uh, but i think yeah, the, the main usage for for, for self-portraits distributed over the internet via social media is is not because you want really to be this this i mean you could want to be this glossy person or, or a specific identity attached to yourself, um, but I think it's mainly used 
in the main part for most people as a means of communicating with each other, whether it be between two persons or between you and, let's say, your audience, the ones you follow. And do you, Ashley, what do you think about that? Um, I believe, I think, I mean, there's very, I think there's loads of elements to, you know, self-portraiture. You can be producing it or you can be, you know, communicating with it, as you're saying. Um, a lot of it is valueless, as you, as you mentioned as well. Um, I just think it's interesting, for me, it's interesting to see the, you know, construction of identity and how it does change. I mean, we all perform in some way, like if you take a photo of yourself, everyone's behind the camera, like, which one's the best? I don't like that one, which one are you going to post? Um, you know, if I'm going to take a selfie, we're going to take like 15 of them and then like choose one. You know, you know, whatever you're putting out into a public space is in a way constructing your identity and you see that with artists of course um, I just uh, you know I think showing there's artists like Petra who you know try to show a reality of what a, a female condition is or a human condition is and then there's other artists uh, like Juno you know she, she's not trying to you know yeah, as you write as you wrote in your own essay in the magazine you're not trying to talk about feminism there's a lot of other issues there um, under the surface like isolation um, in your work, solitude. solitude. Gina would rather talk about solitude for two hours than feminism. Do you know? There's, a, it's kind of everything. There's a lot of layers there. below these photographs. Um, they're not always, you know, on the surface level. Yeah. And what are you working on right now, Gina? Talking about your work. Uh, well, I've just done some new work, so please don't make me do any more. <laughs> um, I have just taken three new images that are showing right now in the fair, and I think they might be on the slides, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll describe them. Um, so I went back to, a lot of my work was shot in, like this one was shot in a honeymoon hotel in America, which is for couples only, and they're quite strict on that. Like, I was the only single person there. And so I went by myself to stay for a week last year, and then this year I felt like I wanted to make some, something more and just add something more to the series, so I found out they had another branch about an hour away. So I went to that one with completely different staff, so they, don't, they had no idea. I had to explain the whole thing again and be like, I'm just here for fun, like, <laughs> la la la. But, um, and yeah, it's just been, wait, sorry, I've completely lost track, tell me your question again. Oh, we were talking about what you're working on right now. Oh, what I'm working on right now. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm showing sure. new images yeah. from this second honeymoon hotel. And yeah, I just kind of went back with a different attitude, I guess. Like, I think the first time I went, I was just like, what am I doing here? This is so weird. And now it's become my studio. It feels like when I'm finally let into this hotel, I'm like, finally, I'm back in the studio. Because other than that, I'm just at home doing nothing. So, yeah. well, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> but when we're talking about yeah. um, actually the private and the public, because the interesting thing is that we're all talking about this uh, ubiquitousness of, of, of images, and there are images everywhere. Our identity is actually also exposed on many places, whatever that identity may be, or identities, perhaps fictional identities. And at the same time, also as you describe it, as a person, but also um, well, this, this character, it's very lonely in a way also, yeah. photography. And I was also, when I was thinking about your exhibition, you always have these, these lonely kind of uh, practices with photographers or sometimes an artist working with a photographer, but it's very much on the spot, it's very precise. And at the same time, it will be shown in many places. It will influence and it will come back and recur over time. Um, and I think it's only getting, getting more like that because everyone is now showing you know, selfies, selfies are also made in solitude and then shown to many people. Um, Ashley, because also Simon also suggested to ask you that, what do you see happening right now? What do you see in the near future happening when we're talking about this, this coming together of, yeah, or identity, posing yourself, posing yourself differently, uh, all these ways of delivering photography? What do you see happening right now? I mean, I think it is. In performative state. Yeah, it is interesting when you say, you know, these photos are taken in isolation, and I know uh, the word alter ego is probably not the right one, but if you look at Cindy Sherman, like her, her photos are, um, you know, she's making untitled film stills, you know, she doesn't look like a shy person, but she actually had like, you know, she was very shy and she had, I'm pretty sure she had like social depression or something, so she would hide away in her studio for, you know, for a few years or something, mm -hmm. making work. Um, it's really different from the, the work that she puts out from what we see of her. We don't know what she's like as a person. We only see a character that she's made as we see Juno's uh, work as well. 
with artists now, I think you have people like uh, Molly Soda, who's a digital artist. She's, uh, you know, in her bedroom often. It, her her settings are like a pink wall um, behind her. She's on her bed. She's doing karaoke or she's crying into the camera. She's kind of confessional style um, thing. If you meet Molly, she's really intelligent. She's hilarious. She's really funny. Um, she is shy, but I think what she what she puts out there is completely different to her actual self, and I find that quite interesting. Um, what I probably put out is quite different to my actual self, I guess, because you're only selecting certain parts to show. Um, also, the, another artist that I spoke about in the essay was uh, Jackson, an Australian artist. Um, his work's really interesting because he takes a selfie. It's really, you know, the banal activity that we go through when we take a selfie in the mirror. Um, and then he Google searches loads of different images, brings them into the photo, kind of like collages them over it. Um, which loses all sense of identity, you know, we don't know who he is in that. Um, I do see a lot of, you know, the younger artists that approach me, I encourage everyone to send me their work if, you know, they want to try and get it on Dazed uh, Digital. Um, so I have a lot of young artists approaching me and they are taking a very, like, self-documentary approach to their work, which is interesting. I don't think it's right for everyone. I just, you know, I just, people sending just photos of I took you know, I get a lot of nudes of sent course. to me. Uh, yeah, I get a lot of people. I think the worrying thing is people see artists like Petra Collins being very successful, and they think, "Oh, I can take some photos in my bathroom, and I can take some photos in my bedroom." But the worrying thing is like self-portraiture and feminism and these kind of things feel like a trend in a way, um, and it's it's then they shouldn't be. No. Um, you should, people, young artists are using them as a means to get famous. They look at Instagram, giving them huge visibility um, and are often disappointed when they're not, you know, given that visibility or that success that they see other people getting. Yeah. It's a bit worrying. Yeah. Um, well, then my last question is for Simon because um, you were talking also in your essay in your exhibition about um, photography and performance coming together and that uh, performative photography also links very much to what photography makes possible, also in a technical sense and now we have well we were talking about many people just sending works to you and um, perhaps even these critical uh, things using using them or exploiting them to um, well, as a trend or something um, and what I find interesting is um, now there are so many methods of delivering photography what do you see happening or what do you perhaps wish for for the craft of photography in relation to performance and that coming together as was very much the basis and I think the start of these two disciplines coming together. Um, uh, oh, that's a tricky question. It um, is. I think uh, on, one, on the one hand we could wish for, well we could wish for work like Juno's that takes making images seriously and actually takes the, the process and the, the, the sort of phenomenological, you know, the, the experience of making the work, like yeah. what it means to go to that place and make yourself into this image, which, uh, which isn't um, obvious. It's not quick, it doesn't happen in like three seconds, and it's actually a, a practice, I would say like a practice in the sense of like a sculptor or a painter. And it's sophisticated and it's people who it's been invested with time and effort. I think we could all hope for that, because that would be great if people really cared enough to actually make things. Um, the other thing would be um, to think about kinds of resistance, like what in what ways can we resist the, um, the sort of um, endless lowering of the common denominator? So that I don't really think we need to hope that everything gets more like the worst stuff. Yeah. And we could really hope that um, some uh, artists uh, who we don't know yet or who are working now have worked out how to do something different and how to make work against the grain, not with it. I don't, I don't think there's anything very interesting about going with the flow, you know, in the in that sense. And so yeah, let's hope for um, let's hope for resistance. Resistance and craftsmanship in a way. <laughs> Practice. Um, well thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful closing remark for this morning. Uh, thank you so much Simon, Lilim, Ashley and Juno and thank you to the audience and uh, a big applause please.